Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Tracing Text with Anton and Sylvia, coming to you from deep in the heart of the state of Tennessee. Yes, and today we are recording episode six, and I understand, Anton, that you are going to be talking to us about Miguel de Cervantes's La Numancia, uh, one of his plays, and I guess um, you're going to talk a little bit about the plot and what it entails and give us a specific focus with respect to the play. So maybe tell us a little bit about when it was published and some general ideas. Yes, yeah, Sylvia, what I'm going to be talking about today, what we're going to be discussing is, as you said, the play La Numancia, which Cervantes um, published uh, or wrote uh, around the mid-1580s, uh, so mm -hmm. in the early part of his literary career, some 20 years or so before he published Don Quixote, which mm -hmm. is obviously his uh, biggest and most important, most popular work. Uh, Cervantes always wanted to be a playwright, uh, and uh, this is an example of his playwriting. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he was never a very successful playwright in his time for different reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them, uh, the fact that he was not following the model of the new comedia, uh -huh. or um, Spanish uh, theater, right. as represented by Lope de Vega and some other uh, playwrights of the time. Right. So he uh, departed from that, and his plays were never as popular as those of Lope. And in fact, um, when his plays were actually published in book form, uh, the volume was called Ocho Comedias y Ocho Entremeses Nunca Representados, which mm -hmm. means that his plays were never, <laughs> never. actually... <laughs> uh, Pre presented on stage. On stage, yes. Uh, so... Uh, as popular and as influential and as well-known as he was as a novelist, right. uh, he was never able to reproduce that sort of uh, success on the stage. Right. And I understand that La Numancia is based on a historical episode of the siege of the village of Numancia by the Romans. Is that the case? That's true. There are uh, several sources of uh, Roman historians that wrote about this siege by the Romans of the um, village of Numancia uh, in Spain. Um, and this is uh, a story that uh, Cervantes adapts for his uh, play. And um, actually, it's, it's quite interesting that uh, Cervantes uh, is presenting a story, mm -hmm. which is actually a tragedy, right. but he is departing from the um, usual parameters of the tragedy as... Uh, from an Aristotelian from, yes, point Yes, from the Aristotelian view. point of view, from going back to uh, classical times. So, for our listeners, what would be an Aristotelian point of view, like, uh, compared to what Cervantes does? Yes, the important, one of the important things that um, Cervantes does in this play is that he makes the play absolutely secular. Okay. And so the gods have no role within the play. They have no bearing on the plot, okay. which is uh, something that um, was very common, uh, a main feature of the uh, classical uh, tragedy. Uh, also, uh, we don't find actually a hero in this, in this tragedy by mm -hmm. Cervantes. Uh, okay. We have uh, a whole uh, town, a whole village, that is sort of like the collective character okay. um, that is the main uh, focus of the uh, play. At the same time, we don't have that tragic flaw of the hero. We don't have a hero, so we don't really so have a tragic no, like, flaw that either. So hubris that is characteristic of most of the heroes in these different plays like Sophocles or something like that. Or Aeschylus, yes. Yeah. No, uh, that's exactly right. Uh, the hubris or the uh, tragic flaw is not present. And really, uh, the uh, tragedy is not brought about by uh, fate. Uh, it is not brought about by the uh, presence of any kind of god. Uh, it is brought about by the um, decisions made by humans, in this case, uh, well, the people of Numancia, uh -huh. but uh, also, and very importantly, uh, the Roman army and uh, its general, Scipio. So what does, so, so you say that it's human decisions that bring about this tragedy, 
Um, can you give us some context as to actually what's going on here? Well, actually, the plot uh, is very interesting in, okay. in this play. Um, the town of Numancia, or the village of Numancia, is under Roman siege. Okay. Uh, and the people that live in Numancia, they want to negotiate their peace with the uh, Roman troops led by, by Scipio. Uh-huh. And Scipio does not want to lose any manpower. He wants to win this war without, uh, or, or, or with as few casualties in his army as possible. But isn't the town of Numancia fairly weak, an, e- an easy win in a sense? It would be, uh, but there's still, you know, the possibility still, that okay. something may go wrong. Uh-huh. There's still the possibility that, uh, you know, a part of his um, army will be killed. Right. And so um, he decides to besiege the city, to okay. set up a siege around the city, uh, and uh, let the uh, people living in the village of Numancia, the Numancians, you know, um, starve to death, basically. But if he, if they, if the Numancians sent, didn't they send an emissary to try to negotiate the peace? Why doesn't Scipio accept this? you know, agreement, then he wouldn't have any casualties. That's true. Um, the um, Numancians, they uh-huh. send an emissary to uh-huh. talk to Scipio and to negotiate the peace, uh-huh. but uh, Scipio wants uh, a victory. He doesn't want a settlement. Okay. Uh, and so he decides to win by starving the population okay. of Numancia to death uh, by means of this siege. Okay. Um, and actually, uh, this brings about a problem for the uh, or it causes a problem for the people in Numancia mm-hmm. because of course if they face the Roman army uh, they're all going to be killed right. uh, they're going to lose because uh, they just don't have the power to face the Roman army so um, at that point uh, they are at a crossroads what what should we do um, and interestingly enough uh, the women in Numancia uh, come up with the uh, solution, or a solution, I guess, uh, in, quotation, in quotation marks. Right, because the best you know. outcome possible, in a sense, that I guess they can, you know, and from their And from their point of view, the only right. way out. And uh, th- that idea that they have is uh, mass suicide. Right. The whole city is going, uh, the whole uh, people living in the, uh, in the village they're going to kill themselves, and they're going to destroy absolutely all their properties so that uh, the uh, Romans will not have any, uh, they, they cannot take any spoils right. back home from uh, this battle against the Numancians. And how is that, um, I would, I guess, since the women decide on this uh, course of action, why do you think the women prefer this over being killed during a battle, because they're going to die anyway. Well, they the women know that uh, their men are going to die, Okay. but not necessarily themselves. And so the problem is, uh, after uh, they lose the battle, the women will be taken as part of the spoils of war uh-huh. by the Romans and um, very likely raped or, uh, you know, enslaved uh, or, you know, uh, th- something terrible would happen to them. And, mm-hmm. and so they decide, they say, well... You know, the men are going to go out there, they're going to be heroes, they're going to die, but what about us? We stay in here, uh, the battle is lost, and then the Romans are simply going to come in, and they're going to take us away and do whatever they will uh, with us. And we don't want this. And so um, one interesting thing of this uh, play, which I think is something that you might be interested in, in fact, is women and men appear at the same level right. in this in this play, and and it's interesting because obviously uh, in the 16th, 17th century this was not the case. If you right. read the literature of the 16th, 17th century, you will very seldom find this sort of situation. Right. Uh, and actually, uh, that course of action that the women decide upon is what the Numancians decide to do. Actually. Um, and indeed, uh, throughout uh, the play, they're going to take certain steps towards um, this mass suicide that uh, happens throughout the so, play. So, in a sense, this uh, allows them to uh, have a more dignified and or a way to not be debased in any sort of way. And that is that's exactly what it is. There's mm-hmm. a certain 
kind of dignity right. in what they do, uh, and it's really uh, in their minds. This is the only way out that is possible because the uh, alternative is um, not a very good one, right. uh, to put it mildly. You're listening to uh, Tracing Texts uh, here with Anton and Sylvia, and we're talking about Cervantes and his play La Numancia, which is not one of the uh, most famous works by Cervantes, but in my opinion, one of the uh, most fascinating. Right. So what else can you tell us about this play? You talk about how uh, in terms of gender there's not a lot of there's not a lot of hierarchical difference between men and women what about social class and that's exactly uh the same situation uh-huh. uh, there are certain warriors within uh-huh. the um uh village of Numancia that are more important than others and some of them we know by name some of them we don't know by name but in, uh, and and of course there's also priests you know mm-hmm. um but one gets the sense that there's not a huge distinction of social class mm-hmm. uh, within this uh, village of Numancia, uh, which is in stark contrast, of course, with the Roman the, army. Uh, yeah, the Roman army on the one hand, and also the um, the society of Spain right. in the 16th and 17th century, in the in the golden age of um, Spain. Right. Okay. And so uh, it is uh, in 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 many ways, this is this is interesting. We we know, as I said, uh, some of them by name, um, but many of them we don't really know by name. And um, what Cervantes is doing here, he's creating a, a collective character, uh-huh. which is one way to depart from the uh, classical principle right. of the uh, tragedy as mm, uh, laid out by Aristotle right. um, and, and do something different, do something do, new, do something more modern. Right. Uh, and, and this is precisely what, what Cervantes does, not just um, by portraying uh, this, this relationship between men and women pretty much on the same level or this uh, lack of uh, social class distinctions but also and more importantly I think uh, the uh, treatment of religion that Cervantes uh, does within this play La Numancia. So you say that the gods really don't interfere as much and that uh, when there is some sort of religion displayed like uh, you said some some rituals or stuff just to clarify since I'm not as familiar with the play is it a would you say like a Greco-Latin type of pagan religion I guess that is portrayed in the play not Catholicism right no there's uh, it's it's definitely not um, a Catholic mm, view okay. of, of, of religion um, but it is religion nonetheless. And right. so when you talk about religion in the 16th century and the 17th it's century... It's going to be a reference mm, to the church nonetheless. Yes, there's always going to be that, that, that connection, okay. right? And it's a very bold thing to do, really, on the part of Cervantes to uh, present a tragedy in which there is no room for God. There is no room for uh, religion. There's no room for any sort of church. Um, very interestingly, at the beginning of the play, Scipio, the Roman general, uh, says to his troops, each man makes his own destiny, fate has no role here, um, which already um, sets us up, or sets the play up, um, to, to, to go towards this, um, this situation where mm-hmm. religion and the gods will not be an important part right. of this play. Because uh, if fate has absolutely no role in here, if each man makes his own destiny, right. Scipio himself is making his own destiny, at, of course winning the battle, right. but failing to bring any, any spoils, spoils of war of war home to Rome. So in that sense, he um, fails. Completely. He does fail, definitely. Uh, and, and it's very interesting that he says that, but he's not able to see that this is what he's doing. So in right. a certain way, the hubris or the, 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 the tragic flaw is that of Scipio, right. not necessarily uh, that of any of the uh, uh, people living in Numancia right. um, at, 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 at that time. Um, I think... Uh, 
when I said before then that the tragedy is caused by human forces or by human decisions, right. that's what I mean. Right. Uh, Scipio makes the decision of not settling for some sort of peace uh, treaties, right. you know, with the um, Numancians, right? Uh, and this will bring about his downfall. Right. From the very from beginning. From the beginning, we this, know this. that this is going to happen. Uh, but then, you know, also the, 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 the tragedy, if we look at the tragedy from the point of view of the uh, people in Numancia, right, uh, it is, again, their own choice right. to kill themselves. Uh, this mass suicide is their own choice to avoid um, a worse situation. Uh, later on, when they lose the war, basically uh, the idea is in in th in a situation like this, where we are besieged by the Romans, where we have no chance of winning, we're gonna we are going to be killed, and our our, our kids may be enslaved, and our uh, women raped, uh, or or taken uh, to to Rome to serve as slaves as well right. of different kinds. Uh, and... It's better to just die. It's better to end our lives. Now, ultimately, this is a type, it's a collective suicide. So considering the time period in which this play is written, how is that perceived by the church? Or is, are, would there be any re repercussions with Cervantes writing a play like this? And this is precisely, Sylvia, where the boldness of Cervantes comes in. Mm -hmm. Because the Council of Trent mm -hmm. at the time had expressly forbidden any sort of suicide in literature. Huh. Now, the reasoning behind this, it, it may sound strange from our point of view right now well, in the 21st century. Well, who knows, because... Right? Uh, this is something that, that's right, but <laughs> it is something that in the 21st century sounds strange, like why would they forbid this? Right. But the reasoning behind um, this, this decree by the Council of Trent was if people were reading about certain things, like suicide, for uh -huh. example, they would be maybe more prone to committing suicide themselves. Right. And so in order to avoid this, uh, there's this express, um, um, well, decree forbidding, uh, prohibiting uh, writing about or portraying any sort of suicide in literature. Now, Cervantes defies this because not only does he uh, right have one, one character kill, it, kill himself? It's a whole <laughs> village, men and women and children. They all you know. decide. Um, so, you know, once again, uh, when we think of Cervantes as a modern writer, this he is precisely what, what we're talking about. You know, uh, uh, one might think, is, is Cervantes in any, is it possible that Cervantes in any way is overrated in the history no, of literature? Definitely My answer not. would be no, because he's constantly defying authority. He's constantly making, th writing about things that sound incredibly modern. Right. Because they are incredibly modern. Right. They, they, they're just not in line with the time right. uh, where he lived. I don't know if he would be in line with the time that we live now ourselves, but, but he, he definitely... definitely is ahead of his time. That's for time sure. Period. And in this case, uh, in, in, in the case of uh, presenting this uh, mass suicide, it is an incredible way to defy the norm. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, there's a certain sort of uh, theme mm -hmm. with suicide in the literature of Cervantes, uh, because in his first uh, novel, La Galatea, which was uh -huh. published in 1585, just around the same time as he was writing this uh, Numancia, this play, uh, there is a shepherd who actually kills himself at the uh -huh. very beginning of the, of the book. Uh, also in the Quixote, in the first part of Don Quixote from 1605, uh, the uh, false shepherd, because he's not really a shepherd, he's just dress, dressing as himself <laughs> as a shepherd, uh -huh. uh, Grisostomo, uh -huh. uh, he also uh, kills himself, he commits suicide because he's uh, not accepted, he's scorned by this woman, Marcella. Uh, although, in that case, Cervantes does it in a very subtle way, because he does not, he, in, in no way does he... Uh, ever actually say that uh, Grisostomo kills himself or commits suicide, but but it's very clear that he uh, does. if you if you know how to read between the lines, and you don't really need to read read between the lines very much, but you know that that this is what happens. So Cervantes is trying to defy uh, the, the the norm at, at all times 
in his in his in his literary career. You're listening to Tracing Texts with Sylvia and with Anton, and we're talking about uh, a play that I really like and that I have read many times, and that I really um, uh, recommend uh, people out there read. I'm sure it is translated into English as uh, all the uh, other works of Cervantes have been. Uh, it's called La Numancia from the 1580s. Um, and, you know, really, mm, one of the things that, that, that is interesting in the portrayal of religion in this place, Sylvia, is that there is a certain um, mocking tone uh-huh. uh, that is applied to any religious ceremonies that appear within the play. Uh, and this is not uh, something, mm, it's not a coincidence that, that this happens, because there are priests within, uh-huh. within uh, Numancia. This. Cervantes is not negating the existence, uh, the existence of religion. Exactly. He could not because, you know... It uh, did exist. It did exist and it still does. Right. Um, but what he's doing uh, in, in this play is he is using the characters in order to mock, to poke fun at these uh, religious ceremonies, and, and they are presented uh, in, uh, as basically in, in, in a very theatrical fashion. Uh, it's it's more a spectacle right. than anything else. Uh, some of the characters uh, make deriding remarks about the uh, clothes right. uh, that the priests are wearing. Uh, they talk about religion as spectacle themselves, right. and it becomes very clear that religion does not have any bearing on um, the outcome of this play, on the plot of this play. But more importantly. You know, uh, religion is not even something that gives any kind of hope to right. these characters. Now, you say religion doesn't have any hope. Um, how does the play end in the sense... We know that, obviously, they all died, all the villagers in Numancia. But how... Is there um, some sort of text that gives us a way of uh, understanding Numancia? Like, what... Do we see them as heroes, as martyrs? How, like, tell me about that. Well, critics uh, have... Um, those critics that have been writing about this play over the decades, a lot of them uh, see this play as an example of Cervantes' nationalism, uh-huh. Spanish nationalism, which to me is, is a mistake because uh, nationalism is too narrow or has too narrow a scope to really uh, understand this play in a, in, a, in a correct way. Cervantes here is not presenting um, the, the Numancians as national heroes, but he's using the Numancians as a vehicle to uh, present this very secularized view of tragedy that you know, he is interested in portraying and, and, and creating. Well, I have a question. How do you understand nationalism? Because that was something that, for example, when you talk about how women are at the same level as mm-hmm. men, and um, I've read several articles in which the idea of nation, although we talk about like borders and this and that when we talk about nation states, in fact, it's women who carry the idea of nation because they're the ones who pass on you know, language and Give customs and-, and all of those things that give us the identity, a national identity. So, I mean... Well, I'm, t- I'm talking about uh, nationalism in this case in, in a political sense. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, uh, Cervantes is not trying to um, present the Numancians as Spanish heroes okay. against the Romans. You know, this is not a nationalistic text no. in, in, in any in, way. In any way. Uh, because Cervantes knows that people uh, don't really have an identity. What people have is personality. Uh, th- this idea of, of uh, national identity would not be um, something that Cervantes would a- a- accept very easily. And we see that in the Quixote as well. And, mm-hmm. you know, we're talking about a, a, about a man who, uh, you know, fought for his country but was never really rewarded for, for, for pretty much anything that he did So in uh, a way, for it's Spain. a critique... Yes, I think I think I, I I would say so. But the thing is, the the critics think, uh, or some critics uh, have mm-hmm. written about this play from a nationalistic 
point of view. Cervantes uh-huh. is really uh, hailing these uh, Spanish heroes who uh, resisted the Romans. They didn't really resist the Romans, <laughs> if you yeah. you know. Uh, but but what they do is uh, they actually have some sort of agency about uh, what they can mm, do with their lives right. in a, an extreme situation like a, a siege, uh, right. which, you know, a siege at any time is, 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 is a really extreme situation. Exactly. Uh, what they do is uh, they, they, they end their lives uh, in almost a nihilistic fashion, right. thinking, you know, the Romans will have won, but they will have nothing to show for it. Right. Now, this brings about the question, did, did Cervantes have any problems with the church because of this play? Uh-huh. Right. Exactly. Uh, because, you know, maybe the listeners are out there are thinking, well, this is, was Cervantes some sort of Superman? You know, he could write about anything he wanted <laughs> and, and nothing happened it. to him. Exactly. Well, in this case, uh, it really shows how, how cunning uh, Cervantes could be. Uh, he's using a historical episode, um, which is about a real um, village that actually committed mass suicide. Right. So he can always say, hey, I'm not inventing anything here. I'm, I'm just, just using an example from history. That's right. Anecdote. <laughs> Only that it's not really history because he is really fictionalizing, right. you know, uh, this this episode. Uh, but but he it has a certain um, uh, root right, and, in, in reality, right. in history, and therefore, um, you know, he, he would be safe from, from that uh, perspective. Uh, okay. Now, it's not a play that was mm, put on stage very often. Uh, in fact, it, it took centuries you know, before, <laughs> you know, it, it, it was definitely um, mm, put on, on, on stage at the time. Um, a few times, uh, uh-huh. but then it took centuries uh, until it was it was it was put again, uh, on stage again. Uh-huh. Uh, the the interesting thing is it was um, put on stage in the 1930s. Interesting. During the Spanish Civil War, uh-huh. um, and 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 there's a, a very uh, famous version of it by Rafael Alberti, uh-huh. very important uh, poet at the time. Right. Um, but of course. There's always this idea of her- uh, heroism right. or heroism or, or you know, the, the, the idea of um, a nationalistic perspective. So that's um, the, what he, what Alberti, like the, what path he took with respect to his interpretation of La Numancia. Mostly, yes. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, we're, we're talking, of course, uh, about a very polarized time when right. Spain was at war, you know, uh, 1930s. Uh, and, and, of course, you know, any any mm, interpretation of this play at the time would have a very strongly political mm, mm, overtone. overtone yeah. Yes. And so, you know, again, uh, in my opinion, this is not a play about Spanish nationalism. Right. This is a play about revising and creating a different uh, kind of tragedy. Mm-hmm. That really um, is the kind of tragedy that um, became popular in the 20th century. You know, if you think of movies <laughs> that are tragic, you know, they're not tragic because of the um, uh, presence of any kind of God right. uh, in most cases. It's usually uh, human decisions that bring about the tragedy, just like Cervantes uh, presents in his Numancia. So basically it's redefining a genre and rewriting the rules of what that genre is. And that's precisely what Cervantes has always done. Right. La Galatea, for example, redefines the whole pastoral Romance of the time, Don Quixote, right. of course, and the inner text right, of the sh- sh- chivalric no- um, uh, novels, and then also, um, you know, when when Cervantes writes uh, something that could be termed picaresque, as we've right. already uh, talked about in, in in a previous episode, like Rinconete and Cortadillo, um, you know, he's going to redefine the. Uh, tradition and is going to try to go beyond. And that's what he does here very mm-hmm. early on right. in his literary career and about two decades before he published uh, Don Quixote. Mm-hmm. Okay. Fascinating stuff, for sure. You're listening to Tracing Texts with Sylvia and Anton, and we're talking about 
Miguel uh, de Cervantes. I'm looking through my notes here, and I think we've probably yeah. covered about yeah. everything we needed to cover about this play. Yeah. I, I would simply like to... Do you want um, to share some closing thoughts or something that you haven't expressed yet that you really want our listeners to, I guess, uh, take away from this episode? Well, what, what I would like to, to uh, stress is, uh, you know, out of three episodes that uh, I, um, let's say, led <laughs> the conversation on, two of them have to do with Cervantes. Um, this has to do with my belief that uh, Cervantes is a writer that um, has been able or was able to encompass everything that came before as mm -hmm. far as, as literature is concerned. Right. You know, uh, the Picaresque tradition, the chivalric tradition, the pastoral tradition, and, 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 and others, uh, classic literature. You know, he's been able to kind of bring all of that together in his literature while at the same time pointing at things to come. Right. If you read the Quixote, for example, it's very clear that a lot of what came before, but also a lot of what would come afterwards, right. uh, is already contained in there. Right. And that is why I feel like Cervantes is such an um, uh, interesting and, and such an important writer. I'm not discovering anything by, by saying this, but it's, it's the way I've always felt about Cervantes, uh, and I don't feel that way about you know, many other writers exactly. for some reason. And so that's the reason why um, I, I'm, I'm so interested in the, in, in, in the works of Cervantes. He's not the only writer I'm interested in by any means, but he is the one to whom I always come back. And every time I read La Numancia, which is not very long, really, right. and you can read it maybe in an afternoon, um, I always find something different, something new. And the idea of, of, of um, the, the, the secular tragedy uh -huh. uh, that he is putting forth uh -huh. in this play, and that at the time did not find any success, but later on uh, would become very important, um, is really uh, one of the most amazing uh, things that Cervantes ever produced. So I really uh, recommend that anyone out there, uh, if you get a chance to read La Numancia, uh, give it a try, and uh, I think you, you'll be able to see a lot of this. You'll be able to uh, enjoy uh, the, the, the play, and the play, just like all the other works by Cervantes, will, um, will be a, a literary work that will make you think about our reality these days right. in, a, in a different way, which I think it's something we all need to do. Uh, is La Numancia translated into English? I believe so. Now, yeah. I'm not totally sure. Uh, I, I can't give you really a, a, an edition that, uh -huh. that I can think of um, off the top of my head, but I am sure that there is an edition out there. Mm -hmm. I, I read it in Spanish, uh, but I know that uh, pretty much all the other works by Cervantes have been translated into English, mm -hmm. so uh, I would be very surprised <laughs> if there isn't a version in English right. of, of this play. Interesting. Well, that's good to know. And so our listeners could hopefully also read La Numancia. Now, Sylvia, you uh, were talking to me before uh, we began this, this um, episode, and you were telling me about what you're thinking about uh, working on for the next episode of Tracing Text coming up next month. Well, you know, I've been on this fan fatale kick. It was started with the introduction of what of the fan fatale is, then we went into a short story by Amparo Davila in our last episode. And I'm going to expl explore a similar topic, but in this case, we're going to be focusing on Elena Garro's uh, Los Recuerdos de del Porvenir, or remem The Remembrances of Things to Come, which is a novel, and Elena Garro is a Mexican writer. So that's what I'm going to be focusing on for the next episode. So we're not changing the scope because, you know, you're that's still my favorite thinking. You still you like think Cervantes, <laughs> I like the Fab Fatal. Yeah, sure. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm in certain ways, in many ways, uh, attracted by that, that sort of, of, of theme, you know, myself. Uh, but the scope is not changed. What we change is... Um, like the material. The, the material. And, you know, we've, we've been dealing with a different time period today. We'll go back to a more, more recent right. literature. Right, and it's going to be... Well, it's written in the early 60s, but it deals 
uh, during the Cristero War, right after the Mexican Revolution, but it's also a period of it's a, a of war and turmoil in Mexico. Well, we'll be looking forward to that, Sylvia. The remembrance of things to come by Sorry. Elena Garro from uh-huh. Mexico. Uh, that'll be our next uh, episode of Tracing Texts. And of course, uh, as always, we're going to be uh, making this episode available on iTunes, which you can download and subscribe. And you also put it on uh, YouTube. Yes, I usually make it available on YouTube as well, so you can and go to YouTube. There's and there's Podomatic, that it, we have it through that's Podomatic. Right. So there are many ways to access the show. And we also have our um, email address. That Which you can send comments or questions, suggestions, and our email address is tracingtext at gmail.com. That's T R A C I N G. T E X T S at gmail.com. I was like, where am I? <laughs> the was, spelling? I felt like I was at the spelling bee contest there and you like, were not sure I can't about stop. it. Because <laughs> you can't go back and you. No, no, no spaces or no anything. No spaces there. tracing text. Yeah. Just. Okay, we're always happy to hear from our listeners and, you know, hope uh, that you have enjoyed all the different episodes that we have recorded so far. And next month we'll have another one, uh, this time led by Sylvia. And, uh, you know, uh, hope that'll be interesting as well to everybody out there. For now, this is all from us, from Anton. And Sylvia. This has been Tracing Texts, live from deep in the heart of the state of Tennessee. Thank you very much, and we'll be back next month.